In order to demonstrate the power of the tripods, there was going to be a scene in Ray Harryhausen's unmade War of the Worlds film in which one of his war machines would destroy a Zeppelin. This came about after a rework of the stop motion master's plans to create a faithful film adaptation of H.G. Wells' story set in its original Victorian period. After struggling to attract finance for the film, however, he changed the setting to the then modern day United States of the 1940s. Harryhausen's new depictions portray Martian tripods in New York City as well as rural parts of America, destroying iconic landmarks including the Brooklyn Bridge, the Holland Tunnel, and of course the Statue of Liberty. What would have perhaps been one of the most visually impressive scenes, however, would have shown a tripod destroying a zeppelin in a scene that would have resembled the 1937 Hindenburg disaster. Well, I say that, but I suspect it actually might have been slightly more than just a resemblance. In Harryhausen's sketch of the scene, it can clearly be seen that this is the Hindenburg. It even has exactly the same mooring tower next to it. Now, naturally, if you're drawing a zeppelin getting destroyed, it makes sense to use an image of an actual zeppelin getting destroyed as a reference. But if I had to guess, I theorise that they may have been intending to use this actual footage of it in the film. It was common practice to use stock footage, and this kind of thing was done in actual films by Harryhausen. A prime example being his 1956 film Earth vs. The Flying Saucers. There are various examples of this technique in this picture. You know, flying saucers imposed over footage of World War II planes crashing to make it look like it was shooting it down, or ending a battle between a UFO and a battleship by cutting to stock footage of a destroyer getting destroyed, and that kind of thing. I presume they'd either have constructed a Zeppelin model to use in certain shots, and then when it gets destroyed it switches to the Hindenburg set in a light, or they might have just purely used footage of the Hindenburg, and maybe other Zeppelins too, with the tripod superimposed over it. Which I could imagine would have been a way to market the film to investors, potentially, considering that using already existing footage would surely be significantly cheaper. I presume this scene was developed to make it more attractive to Hollywood studios, with the idea that they'd be able to have such a dramatic scene in the film done at minimum expense. There's also this concept drawing here, which I kept going back and forth as to whether it's a part of the Zeppelin sequence or not. My initial presumption was that this was shown the inside of the US Air Force bomber, imitating a scene from Orson Welles' 1938 radio broadcast, where a wing of planes attempt to bomb the tripods but are similarly struck down by their heat rays. Although I initially thought the bomber drawing appears to take place over an area with buildings and mountains, that's very unlike the flat open field in which the actual Hindenburg disaster occurred, and therefore I presumed the sketch as well. On a closer look, we can see that actually Harryhausen added mountains in the background of his Zeppelin picture, as well as buildings. The fact he put in these details suggests to me that it could very well be from the same part of the film. I suspect, though this is just speculation, that the Zeppelin scene would have perhaps essentially been this adaptation's version of the Thunderchild sequence, though I feel a more accurate comparison would be the ferry scene from the Spielberg version. Just as in that depiction, I think it would basically depict people, including maybe the main character, attempting to flee the tripods, in this case by boarding an airship. You can just imagine it, full crowds waiting to be evacuated on the crammed mooring tower the Zeppelin is docked at, when, maybe over the mountains, the tripods rise, leading to a chaotic scrambling to get aboard the airship, while its captain naturally immediately undocks the dirigible to try to get away quickly. And actually, I've only just realised after thinking that, but notice how Harryhausen flipped the position of the mooring mast compared to where it is on the Hindenburg photographs. I thought that was weird, but now I realise. In the sketch, it's now by the front of the Zeppelin, where it would have been attached, as if it was just docked to it moments before.
Ropes can also be seen dangling down, I just noticed, which adds to another thought I had that may be due to it suddenly trying to get away. The ground crew handling the ropes get caught up and lifted off the ground, which is something that used to happen and is a scenario that would evoke the moment the ferry begins to move away in the Spielberg film, when its anchor rope cuts the legs out from under those soldiers. And just like in that version, the hasty getaway is futile, and the Zeppelin gets destroyed, to show the devastating power of the Martian machines, and that there's no escape. No matter what you do or where you go, even on a Zeppelin, you can't get away from them. Perhaps after this is when the Air Force comes along, taking the role of the Thunderchild and attempting to destroy them unsuccessfully. Despite these many changes to update the film to the then modern day, Ray was still adamant that his tripods would be faithful recreations of the ones originally envisaged by Wells. Personally, my initial reaction to seeing them was that they looked quite a bit like your generic stereotypical flying saucers, but with legs. Which is interesting, considering Ray later did Earth vs. Flying Saucers. Indeed, just in general, there's definitely parallels between Harryhausen's film about flying saucers invading Earth that he did, and Harryhausen's film about walking saucers invading Earth that he didn't do. It's almost as though he did it in substitute for never getting to make his War of the Worlds. Although blatantly different, it's apparent that the designs are similar, especially with those little slits in them, and arguably even more so when the flying saucers drop down a middle section when necessary, at the same position where his tripods have a similar section from where the legs come from. This being said, I think just the angle of the first image I saw of them in particular emphasises their UFO with legs look, when in reality other drawings, especially the bomber one, reveal a far more dynamic and detailed top half of the body. Not to mention, at least they have legs, and I guess that isn't really something to compliment per se, but it's interesting to point out that while the eventual 1953 film portrayed the tripods as having invisible legs, looking as though they're flying, because of technical limitations and how difficult it would have been to animate the fighting machine's legs, it's very likely that Harryhausen would have actually been able to animate tripods with legs long before before 1953. He'd previously animated the movement of dinosaurs and all sorts of things with his painstaking methods, so these tripods would have been well within his ability. As he said, any imaginative creature or thing can be built and animated convincingly. At first, I thought these tripods looked very mechanical, but actually on closer look, I'm not saying it was meant to be a bone-like structure, but it just looked to me like the parts of this machine were presumably metal were formed in a bone-like way, which I thought was really interesting, which makes a lot of sense considering his background in studying anatomy. Yet again, Harry Harryhausen puts a great deal of thought into his designs and in trying to make them realistic, to the point of expressing with the tripods that the top half of their hoods would spin in one direction while the bottom would spin in the other, in order to provide realism to their movement and balance, based on the logic of a gyroscope. Although none of these primary drawings show the tripods having tentacles, it's clear from the Zeppelin sketch that this was intended to be a feature included in the film, and was also added in this illustration here, done many decades later by artist Graham Humphreys, to accompany the book Harryhausen The Lost Movies by John Walsh, published by Titan Books in 2019. It's a really nice image that cleverly shows Harryhausen's War of the Worlds in a new light, and prominently portrays the Zeppelin scene, hinting at the importance it might have had in the film. Considering Harryhausen's Zeppelin sketch is, from what I've seen, the only instance of him shown his tripods having tentacles, it makes me wonder if the reason he specified this detail this one time was because they would have played a role in the scene, such as maybe it was his intention to have the airship brought down, not by the heat ray, but by the Martian attacking and grabbing it, bringing it down with its tentacles instead. 
Which, thinking about it now, would have been a pretty scary scene, I think, if that was the case. Ray Harryhausen's tripods are a really impressive design, somehow simultaneously imposing, yet elegant. There's something heavenly seeing them lifeless amid the skyscrapers of New York. This design is just utterly beautiful, so incredibly sleek, even just in their stances. They look like they move so gracefully with ease. Utilising these highly articulated legs, they end with basically spiked platforms, likely used to grip any surface and potentially to cause more damage as well. He's done such a good job in a static image of portraying the way they move, just with the positioning of the legs. A reminder that I suck at animating and haven't been able to remotely animate their movement as I fully imagined, but I've given it a go and hopefully it gives some impression of these machines moving. War machines that are depicted as being incredibly powerful, firing heat rays from these circular segments on their saucers. Actually, I guess this is an inaccuracy, considering in the book they have a heat ray attached to an arm. However, it's an inaccuracy that potentially makes them one of the most heavily armed versions of the fighting machines ever depicted, considering they have all these outlets around them, presumably meaning they can fire heat rays from essentially any direction, perhaps simultaneously. Either way, the Harryhausen War Machine is a great design that surely would have been one of the most iconic had this project come to fruition. Which, of course, didn't happen, and I've already got a video covering that story. It's a great shame that we never got to see these sleek machines in action in Ray Harryhausen's War of the Worlds.